Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz, and right now you're hearing testimony on the stand from George Birch himself, the defendant. He is taking the stand in his own defense, and he is describing the moments following uh, when the victim, Nicole Vander Heiden, was found um, what he thinks as dead. He says he can't be certain, but he believes that she was dead at that moment, that he didn't hear any noises, she wasn't twitching. Um, and there was no indication that she was still alive. And he is explaining that he is acting at the direction of someone else. He still has not disclosed who that someone else is. But one can only expect, but as, as you've been watching this case unfold, he is going to point the finger to the victim's uh, boyfriend, who she was in a fight with at the time. Um, with me is Bobby Chacon, a former FBI unit head. Bobby. Thank you for joining us to talk about this case. Um, as someone who is pretty up high up at the FBI, you probably have a pretty good sense of character and how to evaluate somebody. Watching this guy, this defendant, take the stand, to me he seems pretty calm, pretty collected, and pretty likable. Do you, what is your take on him, just uh, based on his mannerisms? Well, based on his mannerisms, he almost seems too calm. And, you know, he's walking through a story that's clearly well rehearsed with his defense attorneys. Um, it answers all the questions that they need. The defense attorney is taking a long time between his finishing an answer and asking the next question, um, letting it sink into the jury. So this is a very well rehearsed, um, very practiced uh, witness. Uh, and, and as you would think he would be, right? He's Obviously, when you take the, the stand in your own defense, it's, it's a, it, you're the crucial witness of the case. Uh, it really, you know, you can lose or win the case, you know, just on this one witness. So, um, but he, he does seem very calm, very rehearsed, you know, and that can cut both ways. I mean, we know that, you know, I know as an investigator that he's been in the system before. I think he's got five arrests. He's, he, he may have even been on a murder charge. All right, we got to go to a quick break. So we'll see what happens with cross-examination if he flips. But he is uh, calm and collected. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz, and that is George Birch taking the stand in his own defense, explaining what happened in the moments after Nicole uh, Vander Heiden was found dead and how he helped having to clean up the mess. He was blaming it on a third party, and now we are hearing who that third party is, and he is saying it is her uh, boyfriend, uh, Doug Dietrich, who we heard take the stand earlier today. With me is Bobby Chacon, former FBI unit head. Bobby, I want to give you the opportunity before we go to a break to quickly comment on his testimony, whether or not it's believable that a third party was involved. As someone who works with the FBI, you must have experience in these types of cases of placing blame on someone else versus being actually culpable himself. What do you think? Sure, I think the defense knows that there's a lot of um, forensic evidence that puts him at her place, uh, where her body was found, on the uh, turnoff where cl clothes were found. So they come up with this story that conveniently puts him everywhere where the prosecution has forensic evidence, putting him close to her at the time of her, you know, attack and then at the okay. time of her body dump. Uh, so it's really convenient. Uh, okay, that we've got to go to a quick break. We're going to continue with this trial and cross-examination after this uh, quick break. Stick with us. We will be right back. Welcome back to Law and Crime. I'm Carissa Krantz. And as usual on this network, we're always covering a whole bunch of things at once. And right now, we are covering and are going to go into uh, the Molly Tibbetts case. This is the case of the missing 20-year-old girl who the entire nation is banding together to try to find. Funds have been ra uh, raised in excess of $360,000. A dedicated website has been made for tips to pour in. And everyone is hoping and praying that she can come home safely. We do have some updates in this case. With me is Bobby Chacon, a former FBI unit head. Uh, Bobby, I'd like to give you the opportunity to give us some updates and even let us know about those videos that we're looking at right there. So, you know, the, the one update that I got this morning was that they have uh, they seem to be um, zeroing in on five different areas in and around Brooklyn, Iowa, where she was last seen. And um, so they have five what looks like distinct areas. One is a car wash, two are on farmland. And, um, and so these are creating some some additional interest in why the police are searching in these particular areas. Now, they're not releasing what gives them 
uh, interest in these five specific areas, and, and that's probably to protect the investigation. But, you know, it's at this point in the investigation when they're interviewing a lot of people, when they're getting a lot of tips, that they're going to have a more direct uh, or more directed searches in, in more specific areas that probably are leading from some of the tips they're getting and some of the interviews that they're doing. Um, and you take that with their other investigative methods, and that's probably leading them to, you know, more specific areas. Because in the beginning of an investigation, before you have a lot of information, your searches are going to be more generalized over a wider geographic area. But now that they're sifting through all the information they have and all the statements they're getting in, now we're starting to see, you know, and we can, you know, probably try to interpret um, uh, or tell a story based on where they're searching on these particular, you know, in these particular geographic areas. But they certainly seem to be, you know, um, kind of zooming in on certain specific areas right now. Okay, so someone who's been with the FBI for you know, quite some time and as a unit head, I mean, this investigation has been going on for, I mean, it's still fairly new, but it's been going on for quite some time. Um, and everyone is on pins and needles wanting answers and wanting more information. We listened to a press conference here on the network live yesterday. We did get uh, some more information, but we still don't have answers. Every time we listen in on these press conferences, there are little nuggets of new information and possibly pieces of hope. What is your um, take on this? Do you think that there's hope that she's alive and could be returned home safely? Or do you think that the possibility and chances of that are looking more and more grim each day? Well, you know, there's always hope, obviously, until you find the person and they're, they're deceased. There's always hope. Um, however, you know, we know factually and statistically that with each passing day, um, those hopes get less and less. And statistically, the chances of finding um, the person uh, alive or well uh, go down with each passing day. That's just, that's a harsh reality of, of statistics, that, you know, that are compiled with all these cases. Of course, every case is different. Every case, there's a, there's a chance and a possibility that something other than what we're all dreading uh, happens. And so you, 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 you do hold out hope for the family, um, but the investigators have to go, you know, wherever the evidence takes them or wherever their, you know, investigation leads them. And, you know, right now it's leading them to, you know, these five specific areas where, you know, if she's found in any of those five areas, it wouldn't, you wouldn't think that uh, those are places she would still be alive. Um, but things like the car wash, they could be looking at just for clues. They could be looking for other clues. So, you know, some of these places they're looking for, they're not necessarily looking for her body, depends on what the investigation tells them. Um, they're, they're just letting out as much information as they have to. Um, they're holding everything back for the good of the investigation. Their top priority right now is that investigation. And um, they've got to protect their investigation. Their ultimate goal is to, is to find Molly and get the person responsible if she's met harm, to get the person responsible to cause that harm, you know, convicted and put away. So, you know, th that's their main objective. So the, the release of information or the withholding of information, you know, is all driven by what's best for the investigation. Absolutely. They don't want to uh, compromise the integrity of the investigation in any way by giving the public information because we're all here on pins and needles wanting information to resolve the mystery and want her to come home safely. But it's more important to keep the investigation um, as untainted and as pure as possible to have the best outcome and result. If there's any hope of bringing her home safely and alive, then that, that is the top priority and the goal. And it's really moving how the public has come together. Um, yesterday, we heard an interview on the network from uh, Rachel Stockman with Ed Smart, which was Elizabeth Smart's dad, um, which had a lot of eerie parallels of facts about a young girl that went missing and how she was out for a run. And um, we had the father yesterday of uh, Molly get, you know, some sound bites versus Ed Smart, Elizabeth's father. And, and there's a lot of parallels about holding out hope and how a parent can have that inner feeling and, and know. And um, I think, you know, you hear the case of Ed Smart and Elizabeth Smart. That was a happy ending. That case worked out. So, and he did say, continue. The key is to continue to engage the public. To continue to engage the public. Let everyone and anyone know, so everyone and anyone can be part of this investigation to help solve, solve it and bring Molly home safely. Do you think that the Ed Smart um, and Elizabeth Smart scenario is comparable in this case, or do you think that that was just a one-off where Elizabeth Smart got really lucky? Well, certainly statistically, based on, you know, child abductions, Elizabeth Smart got very lucky because most we know, you know, from these cases that most of them don't turn out that way. 
I mean, we do have the anomalies. You have the Stacey Dugard cases where she was gone for 19 years and was returned safely. So, you know, you do have those cases, and I understand that it's every parent and every family's hope to, and desire to hold on to that hope. The investigators, though, they have to kind of divorce themselves from that, and they have to, you know, plow ahead and just look objectively at where the evidence in the case is leading them. You know, they, they, they know every one of those investigators, I guarantee, because I was part of that, um, every night when they lay their head on their pillow and go to bed, they understand that's one more night that they haven't successfully concluded the investigation. And with every passing day, the odds go down further and further of a successful resolution. So, you know, they're out there every day working as long as they possibly can on every lead that they can to, to resolve the case. Well, hopefully they will find Molly Tibbetts and bring her home safely. Yesterday, during the press conference, they said that findingmolly.iowa.gov is the dedicated website where tips can pour in in a more streamlined way. And hopefully this will have a resolution that brings peace to the community and to the families and brings Molly home safely. So we're going to continue to cover that for everyone here on the network. But now we have to switch gears again and go to the trial that we're covering, our main trial. It's the George Birch case out of Wisconsin. George Birch is accused of of savagely beating, strangling, and murdering a mother, Nicole Vanderheiden. He is on the stand in his own defense. The defense is putting on their case. There she is. Uh, there she is with her baby in the picture. She was a mother. And there she is on the screen with her boyfriend, who also took the stand, Doug Dietrich. Right now, we're listening to the defendant say he didn't actually commit the killing, but that the boyfriend that you just saw on the screen is the guilty one, and that he worked and acted at the direction of the boyfriend to dispose the body. We were listening to direct examination. I think it was a strong direct examination, but we'll see how the body language changes. Um, okay, we're having some technical difficulties, so we're going to talk about this on set for a minute before we go into the courtroom um, to see his cross-examination. So, Bobby... Um, I, I wanted to ask you, before we go into cross-examination and go back into the courtroom, do you think that the cross-examination is going to uh, change his demeanor, or do you think he's going to stay calm and collected? Well, that's the prosecution's aim, is to change his demeanor, is to get him off his game. Um, and obviously, his defense has rehearsed him very well. They very probably... well. Either he's very well rehearsed or he's telling the truth. Because uh, direct examination, direct, direct examination, I think, went really well. And I think it's actually possible that Doug Dietrich, um, you know, killed her, uh, you know, and that he was in an unfortunate situation in the wrong place at the wrong time. I think it was believable. Now, the one thing I have a problem with is that his story starts out that he was in the car with her and he, the next thing he knows he, is he woke up and, you know, presumably, you know, I guess his story is that somehow Doug Dietrich struck him in the head, uh, causing him an injury hard enough to lose consciousness and black out for a while. And then he wakes up and he sees him and the woman dead. Uh, an injury that causes a loss of consciousness is a pretty hard blow to the head. And in retrospect, when he's reciting the story of grabbing her... But is it possible he didn't lose consciousness, that maybe he was just traumatized? We have to go to a quick break. We'll have to see and dissect this after the break. We're fixing our technical difficulties, and we'll be back in the courtroom as soon as we return. Stick with us. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz, and that is George Birch taking the stand in his own defense. But that is cross-examination, and he did lose his cool a little bit while he's being cross-examined. However, he still seems to be very direct and in his resolve of what he's saying and that what he's saying is what he means and that he is not guilty. He is sticking to his story. How the jury is taking that, I don't know. That is yet to be seen. Um, Bobby, Bobby Chacon you're, uh, is with me still. Um, Bobby, I wanted to give you some final thoughts before we end our day, and I know you have to sign off as well. Sure, no, this is the fascinating part of the case. This is the, the I know, culmination it's the most of fascinating it. part, and we have to go. <laughs> no, it's like when a defendant takes the stand and he's on cross-examination from an aggressive prosecutor, so, you know, that's that's the movie moment. We real quick, because we don't have a lot of time. Do you think he's guilty or do you think he's not? I personally think he's guilty. You think, and real quick, with, that, with the testimony we're hearing, do you think he's holding it together on cross-examination or do you think he's falling apart? So far, but the prosecutor's starting to make some cracks. The prosecutor is making some cracks in the case, like you heard him say you don't remember, but you you had a bump on the head, but no one could see it. And but then I think he had a good comeback. He said that he was six foot, you know, he, he's he's over six feet, and it's not easy to see the top of his head. 
That's right. That's right. So yeah, I mean, it's about it's you know it's a boxing match, something like this. So somebody lands a punch and somebody counter punches, and and that's the way it goes. Right. Okay. Well, Bobby, I want to thank you for joining us. I know you came on last minute and stood in when another guest couldn't join us today. So we appreciate that and all your insight on this case sure. and on Molly Tibbetts and. Even on uh, the Shana Huber's case, we've had quite the rundown today of different uh, topics we've been covering. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to being back with you again soon. And as for me, I'm also going to be signing off today. Um, the rest of your day is going to be carried by Stacey Delicate, and she will continue with the uh, cross-examination in the uh, George uh, Birch trial out of Wisconsin and the rest of the cases that we're covering here on the network for you, as we always do, live here on Long Crime. Thanks for joining us, and we will be b I will be back here again next week. And stay tuned after this quick break for Stacy.